August of 1980, and I'm at the home of uh, Justice uh, Denver Davison, and that, I believe, is D-A-V-I-S-O-N, no D on that. And uh, Justice Davison uh, retired about a year ago as, the, as a uh, justice of the Supreme Court. He had served... Uh, uh, on two different occasions as chief, three different occasions as chief justice of the Supreme Court. And if I'm correct, he has 41 years in the Supreme Court, and if I'm correct, he served in the Supreme Court longer than any other individual. Is that correct? Um, i uh, like to start an interview by asking you a little about your family background, who your parents were, your mother's, uh, your father's name, your mother's maiden name, and uh, uh, if they were, to, if they came to Oklahoma or Oklahoma Territory, what caused them to come here? Could you tell me a little about your parents? Uh, yes, my father's name was Benny, Benjamin P. Davison, and my mother's maiden name was Lottie Lewis. And they lived in Missouri. I was born in uh, Rich Hill, Missouri. And uh, they came to Oklahoma in uh, 1907. And uh, my father opened a coal mine uh, in uh, Bacosha, Oklahoma. And uh, we lived in Bacosha, Oklahoma for several years, and then my family moved to Colgate. And uh, he operated the mine in Colgate. And... Uh, had your father been in the mining business? Yes, he, he had been in the mining business all his life. Um, Well, oh yes, <clears throat> yes. Uh, I <clears throat> I graduated from the prep school, University of Missouri Preparatory School, and then I went to Missouri University two years. And uh, my f people were living in Oklahoma at the time. And, uh, but then I came to Oklahoma, I went to the University of Oklahoma to study law and took all my law courses in Oklahoma University and graduated in 1915. While there I was made a member of Phi Delta Phi Honorary Legal Fraternity, and I was a member of Alpha Tau Omega Fraternity when I was in the University of Missouri. Can I talk a little about the university? Do you remember it in 1907 during the war, uh, what it was like there at the University of Oklahoma? Well, it was a little bit before the war, because <coughs> I graduated in 1915. And, uh, well, it, uh, the, the law school was uh, rather new. Dean Monette was the dean, and he built it up quite a bit. And the first year I was there, we was down in the basement of the library building. But they was building the new law building at that time, so the, letter, the next Latter years, I went to the regular law building, which had been was brand new. Since that time, they've got a, another brand new law building. Uh, there wasn't so many students at the university at that time, and everybody knew everybody else. And uh, it's not like it's anything like it's large then as it was as it is now. Do you recall any of your classmates in law school who may have uh, later become uh, prominent in legal or other areas? Well, I 
Alfred Stevenson at Holdenville was very prominent in later years. And uh, I don't remember the others. Oh, I would say there was about 25 in the class that graduated, but as far as I remember. What did, uh, now on graduation, what did you do after you graduated? I went to uh, Lehigh, Oklahoma. Uh, it was a little town, a small town in Cole County. But at that time, the mines were all working in Lehigh, and Lehigh was about as large as Colgate. And I planned on moving to Colgate, which I did later, but uh, I wanted to go down to Lehigh and get acquainted with people in that south end of Cole County. And when I was there, I <coughs> saved up a very little bit amount of money, and the owner of the newspaper, Mr. Whitmore, the only paper in town, wanted to sell the newspaper to his son and me, and uh, he wanted to go out to Idaho, and so uh, his son and I bought the paper, the, the banker uh, went on our notes for the full amount, and uh, we let our, all of our earnings go into the payment of this note. And we paid it off before long. That was Lehigh News. And about uh, 18 months, Mr. Whitmore came back, and he wasn't satisfied out in Idaho. And uh, he asked me if, if he could buy the paper back so he and his son Ernest could run it. And... Uh, I told him, yes, we had built the paper up uh, quite a few more subscriptions. And uh, he asked me what I wanted for it, and I told him, I said, Mr. Whitmore, uh, exactly what we paid you. And uh, so we made that trade that very day. I was wanting to go out to Colgate at that time anyway. I'd, I'd gotten acquainted down at Lehigh, and felt like I could move to Colgate, and I did then move to Colgate. And uh, I was just in Colgate a short time. I went in the county attorney's office, and uh, then soon went to war, and uh, I got married a short time before I went to the Army. And, uh, but uh, I served 18 months then in World War I and came back and um, my wife stayed with me a little while down in San Antonio when I was there and we had a son born. And, uh, when I came back, I had a wife and a baby and uh, no money. So, well, I, I, was, I first was in the Signal Corps, and then later uh, I was in the Quartermaster Corps doing uh, contracting work, contracting and buying. Uh, I went in as a private, came out a second lieutenant. The, uh, so you came back after the war. You Am I talking too close? No, no, you're fine. You're, you're good. And uh, so what did you, uh, what happened to you after the war? Where did you go? I came back to Colgate and uh, when I first got there, <coughs> 
Judge Trice, who was the leading lawyer in that part of the country, told me, uh, and I'd known him real well and tried some cases for him uh, when I was in Lehigh, or uh, tried some cases against him. And he told me that he wanted me to come in as a junior partner. But he didn't have any room at that time because P.L. Gassaway was in his office studying law. And uh, But at the first of the year, uh, P.L. was to take the bar examination. He took it and passed. And then I went in with Mr. Trice. And... Uh, on the terms, he said, I've been here for a long time. He represented all the coal mining companies and had the best business in that part of the country. And uh, he told me, he said, I think I'm uh, older and built up the business. He said, I think a fair deal now would be for me to have two-thirds and you one-third. And I told him I thought that was very satisfactory. And uh, so we were partners uh, from the time, that time on until we moved to Ada together. And we were partners in Ada until he passed away. We've been partners some, oh, some 15 years, I guess. No, most of them were mine run cases. We represent the coal mines, uh, all of them. And uh, of course, when they had accidents or anything like that, we represented the company. But, uh, and then we uh, did some criminal work. We defended quite a few. Uh, uh, homicide case, defendants in homicide cases. Uh, they were different kind of cases. Criminal cases were entirely different then than they are now. Most of the homicide cases came up then about those days for somebody stealing a cow or cutting down a fence or so forth. So, yeah. Resulting in homicide, but they don't. There wasn't the same type of case that we have now. Were there any coal mining disasters that you became involved in cases on where a lot of people were killed, had a, 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 a cave in or anything like that? No, no. I, I don't think we had any cases in, that involved over one person at a time. Well, it was all uh, corporate work. We represented the First National Bank, Home Building and Loan Association, represented PA Norris's uh, business, all of his different various kinds of businesses. Rep we represented the Choctaw Cotton Oil Company, and uh, it's a general civil business. Now, Kerr, Robert S. Kerr was from Ada. Were you uh, closely friends with him? Oh, yes, very close. Do you remember anything about him that uh, is particularly memorable that might be worth mentioning? No, Bob and I all, were always friendly. Uh, from the first time I met him until he passed away. We tried to... Uh, a number of cases where he'd be on one side and I'd be on the other. He was a good lawyer. And, uh, we, 
We were always very sociable. Now he was uh, uh, his uh, firm. He, he 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 was with a law firm at that time. Yeah. And let's see, who was he in partnership with? Larry Harrell. Now, Oral Busby who was uh, a mayor too, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, Oral was uh, uh, on the Supreme Court, and uh, he defeated uh, J.W. Clark, who had been on the court for about eight years, and uh, Busby, just Busby, uh, didn't like it too well. The oil business started in eight, and he was quite a trader and he wanted to get back and make some money. So he resigned and I was appointed in oh, his place. Yeah. The uh, uh, Jack Kahn was an attorney in Ada, but that was probably after you had gone on the Supreme Court, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Jack worked for me uh, one summer. He worked like the Dickens, but he didn't get any pay. <laughs> well, he came out there. Jack was a good friend of mine, and we had uh, one legal assistant at the time. There was only one for pay. And Jack came out one day and he told me, he said, Judge said, I'd like to go to work for you. And uh, I said, well, Jack, we don't have any... We just have one, and, and uh, we don't have pay for only one. He said, oh, he said, I wouldn't want any pay. He said, I just want experience. So I said, well, get your coat off. <laughs> so he worked for me all one summer, and he did a good job. Is that why he was a student? No, he had just graduated. Make you a good hand? Very good hand. He's a smart character. Smart boy and fine boy. Yeah. Um, the um, you don't remember though any any cases in Ada that stand out to you either as memorable to you. What was the most interesting case you had in all of your career as a lawyer? Well, I. Uh, that's pretty hard to answer. I I was interested in all of them. I guess maybe the most interesting one that uh, we had was uh, we defended the fellow for killing his son-in-law. They got mad and he took a shot at him from long distance. Killed him. Just a uh, shot that uh, wouldn't happen again in years because of the distance. And uh, we defend him. And it was quite a lawsuit. Uh, both of them were respectable people. Did, uh, now, you you went on the Supreme Court when Judge Busby resigned. Were you appointed then? Yes, by Governor Marlin. Governor Marlin. Uh, and that was what year, 1930? 1937, August the 7th. Was it a, a surprise to you to be appointed? I mean, were you, were, were you looking to a judicial career? No, I wasn't thinking about it until uh, about a month before Judge Busby told me that he was going to resign and he'd like for me to be appointed. And that's the only thing I, I hadn't even thought about it. Had you been a judge? No, I had, uh, I had been county attorney before. The... Um How did, uh, uh, how did you have to get appointed? Had you had a friendship uh, with uh, Mr. Marlin? Had you made any call or was it a recommendation of 
I had only met him one time, and the appointment came through really from through Al Nichols, oh, who was senator from yeah. our district. Al wanted me to take it, and uh, so he uh, maneuvered. It. First, I was uh, Governor Portland, uh, Governor Marlin appointed me on the original Rogers Commission, Will Rogers Commission, to build the building over in Claremore. And uh, this committee had a number of meetings with architects of various kinds. We had all kinds of designs. And uh, we finally picked out the design we wanted, uh, which is now the building over in Claremore. And the architect, whose name was Forsyth, wanted me to go out to uh, Los Angeles with him to see Ms. Rogers, uh, to see whether she had any suggestions to make about this new building before it started. And I went out with him and uh, paid my own expenses, incidentally. And uh, we met with Mrs. Rogers and her family. Had a very delightful evening with them. And uh, they were highly elated with the building the way it was, and they had no suggestions whatsoever to make on it. So uh, while I was out there, I had a very good time. Young Will was there. He took us out to Hollywood the next day uh, to 20th, 20th Century Fox, and they really treated us royally out there on account of being Young Will. Uh, they hadn't seen young Will since his father died, and, and everybody out there loved Will Rogers. Who were some of those who, incidentally, you mentioned Al Nichols. We ha I have made a couple of tapes with him, very interesting tapes. Uh, he's, uh, he's almost blind now. Yes. I saw him about a year ago, and he's getting hard to see. Yeah, I... Uh, uh, I see Al occasionally. <clears throat> he, uh, well, uh, the Fidelity National Bank had a, what they call an old time settlers uh, dinner every year. And Al's always there. I, I've got some pictures of us in, our, in my scrapbook. And, uh, Al's always there, Jim Nance, much of the old timer. The uh, let's talk a little more about the Will Rogers Commission that built that. I didn't realize you were on that original commission. Uh, why don't you? Who was chairman of that commission at that time? Uh, I believe uh, Walter Harrison was, who's uh, editor. Uh, uh, Daily Oklahoma, and uh, either he or Norris Henthorn, I of the Tulsa World. I don't remember who. Who were other key people who played a role on that uh, memorial? Well, it's been so long ago, and I haven't thought about it, and I just can't. Uh, I can't recall her names now. One of them, I, I tried to think of his name, a very close friend. He was manager of the Will Rogers Hotel over That's there for Martin years. Harrison. Martin Harrison, yeah. I couldn't think of his name. The, uh, yes, he died for We have a tape with you. Oh, sure now. Uh, the, uh, do you recall any other experiences dealing with the Will Rogers Memorial Commission? No, I 
I can't think of anything uh, important. We we all enjoyed our work, and I guess we must have had 20 meetings with uh, different architects and and uh, different drawings, ideas of the building. Did you select it by competition? Oh yes, yes. Looking at uh, the one that you on the artist drawing, the one. That yes. You wrote. Oh, yes. What uh, were, uh, were they basically the same, or were there, were there very wild differences between what some Well, there's quite a bit of differences, you know, but uh, I don't remember just all of the different kind now, but they, were, they, they varied greatly. But we thought the one we picked was the one, the right one, and uh, Ms. Rogers thought so too, and the, the whole Rogers family thought so. Did you serve on the commission after the museum was completed for a period of time? Yes. Um, coming to the Supreme Court, uh, Having never been a judge before, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure it's uh, a lot of changes from a trial lawyer to the Supreme Court all of a sudden. Um, can you uh, tell me some of the uh, uh, some of the difficulties that may be involved in uh, in making that transition? Well. <coughs> I don't think much because it seemed like every case we had on the Supreme Court, I had already had some experience in my trial practice with, and uh, it wasn't too hard for me. The uh, who were some of the justices at the time you went on that? Uh, those who are the most memorable. Well, Thurman Hurst, Tom Gibson, Fletcher Riley, Monroe Osborne, Earl Welsh, Harris Dunner, some that you served with over the period that you considered in your, uh, uh, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, I said among the outstanding uh, justices. I, I know that many will stand out in different ways, but some that, that you considered among the most outstanding judges you've known. Well, I, <coughs> I think uh, Monroe Osborne was very outstanding, great lawyer, great fellow, great friend. Where was he from? Uh, Paul's Valley. Uh, can you think of any particular characteristics about him? That, uh... Well, he was a hard worker and uh, had a wonderful memory. And uh, he could uh, remember every case and the contents of every case it looked like that uh, had been before. How about Judge Gibson? Very fine judge. Judge Gibson was exceptionally uh, smart on uh, municipal affairs and he's in the scope. Yes. And a very fine man. Now Fletcher Riley was from here, wasn't he? Oklahoma City? Was he? Well no, he's from Lawton. He was from Lawton. Mm -hmm. The uh 
in the some of the early cases that you had there, now that was the 30s, it was the uh, during the Depression period and such, um, what were some of the memorable cases that came to the Supreme Court during that period? Either historic, uh, landmark cases, or maybe just uh, uh, an interesting case. Well, we had a lot of them, but I think uh, I think it fell my duty to uh, write an opinion and what I think is was one of the most memorable historical cases that we've had in some time, any time. That was a case of... Uh, Patterson versus Stanley Oil Company, and uh, it involved the, the uh, a new statute been passed for conservation of oil and gas, and uh, Patterson had a. As I recall, a six and a half interest in a ten acre tract. And uh, the Corporation Commission declared a ten acre spacing, the first spacing they had done. And uh, they drilled a well on, on, uh, the portion of this 10 acres that, that Patterson had a six and a half interest in it. And he thought that he was entitled to the full uh, oil and gas royalty. But uh, the trial court held that uh, he wasn't entitled to all of it, but the other people who owned the other part of the 10 acres was entitled to it under the spacing ruling that the Corporation Commission made. And uh, the trial court held against Patterson and came to me. It happened to be Russell Patterson was a good friend of mine. Uh, I was sorry the cases signed to me. The Chief Justice signs all the cases. But uh, it, uh, it it was rather difficult case. But uh, the court went along with my opinion, which held that the the uh, corporation commission had that right to make the spacing under the new law, and. Uh, at that time, the oil industry was pretty new just all over the United States, I'd say. That was in, uh, oh, about 1939, I guess. And uh, that case was appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States and uh, was affirmed by that court. And uh, it's been followed by a lot of states, a number of states, like Illinois, for instance, uh, that they used our opinion in their cases. So as far as I know, it's been approved by every state that's, that's, that's its question. Any other landmark decisions that you wrote that you think I brought in? Oh, uh, I can't think of any. They're all so years. important, and yeah, and no, I've written a lot of opinions. Sure. How do they decide who writes that opinion? The Chief Justice assigns all the opinions. Out. What does he base it on? Does he 
just kind of divide them out? Uh, well, and he... Decide who is the best qualified to write that particular opinion? Well, I think both. But they try not to overload any one person. Now, sometimes a minority opinion is written. Uh, uh, what would be the... Uh, uh, if they, if they have a split, do they always have a minority opinion or not? Oh, no, not unless somebody dissents and feel like he wants to express his views. In other words, uh, you could vote against the majority, but if you don't want to write an opinion on it, you just you, dissent. You just dissent. But if you want to write an opinion, you make that request, and automatically you have that right. Yes. What if uh, two dissent uh, and want to write an opinion? Does the Supreme Court, uh, do, do they have two minority opinions, or does the justice uh, sign one, as Chief Justice? Well, I don't know that I get your question right. Uh, but if two people dissented, you, you dissented and Judge Barry dissented, and both of you would like to write a minority opinion. Yes, you, you can. You can both write one if you want. Yes. In other words, four of you descended. Four of you could write a. You might uh, have different views yes. in uh, in your writing. What um, the um, do you think of any other cases? I notice you have written a few notes uh, down, uh, and uh, I wonder if there any other cases that should be mentioned that you have not mentioned that uh, you may have written a note on that stand out to you? No, not, uh, not that I think of. What would you say, uh, you have all kinds of cases that come, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's hard to just uh, feel a question over that long a period of time, just remember what it is, and you, maybe if you were to think it over, you you might think another one would be more so, but what would you say was the most uh, uh, important case that came before the Supreme Court when you were a justice? Well, I, I think this case that I just it. referred to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you know, uh, they can speak. Corporation Commission can space uh, 640 acres, and that's uh, for the purpose of conservation. Uh, like under that 10-acre case that I gave you, uh, the theory of it is you get more oil out of it with one well than you would uh, three wells. What was the most, uh, oh, maybe the funniest or most, uh, for one reason or another, became an amusing case. Can you think of one there that you're laughing a little, maybe you mean? Well, <laughs> that's pretty hard. Uh, if I'd known he was going to ask me that question, I... <laughs> Before I could have thought about it a little bit. Hello. Uh, I, th I think uh, one amusing thing, maybe, Judge Riley, who was an excellent writer. Remember, we had a case about a question involved whether. Catholic Church over in uh, Tulsa would have to pay taxes. And uh, Judge Riley wrote a long, excellent opinion that uh, gave the whole history of the Catholic Church and, and uh, did a lot of bragging about the church and so forth. And uh, we all agreed with the result of his opinion was that the church was not taxable. 
and uh, but we wouldn't let him hand it down the way it was written way too long and uh, so Judge Arnold was signed to Judge Arnold right there in the conference room and Judge Arnold uh, just scratched out about three-fourths of Riley's opinion in conference, and we adopted it right there. Riley wouldn't change his mind on it. He wanted to handle down the whole thing or nothing. Was Judge Riley Catholic? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, uh, what about the uh, uh, division? Courts have divisions. You in the Supreme Court of the United States, you know, you can uh, sometimes predict what the uh, split is going to be in the vote on uh, on some case before the Supreme Court. Why don't you talk a little about uh, uh, what divisions over the years may have existed within the Oklahoma Supreme Court the philosophy? Well, <clears throat> on uh, some questions, people, different people just got different ideas. And, uh, it's hard to give you any examples right now, but uh, they just think differently. Yes. I had wondered, uh, you know, uh, had uh, in the Oklahoma Supreme Court, if there's as much there, there probably the Oklahoma Supreme Court is uh, um, its cases sometimes are not as visible to the general public as the uh, uh, as the U.S. Supreme Court. In other words, not that the publicity around them is not no. as heavy, and you and you don't uh, you 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 don't identify the individual justices, the the average person. Uh, not lawyers would be different, but the average person does not identify the individual justices of the Supreme Court uh, to the extent that they would the uh, justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. And I had uh, wondered, you know, if uh, uh, if if there was uh, what you might consider a conservative wing or liberal wing or such like that in those uh, Supreme uh, the, the, in the uh, in the Oklahoma Supreme Court, as you might have been the U.S. Supreme Court, possibly not. I don't know. I don't think so. You don't think so? Uh -huh. I know that uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court is such a concern. Who's going to appoint the next justice? Which president will it be? Because if it's this president with this political philosophy, they'll yeah. have this kind of a justice, and uh, and vice versa. You know. If it's no, we, <coughs> no, we don't have a thing. Uh -huh. Um, the um, do you think of any other cases that uh, that that stand out? You mentioned the oil case, the Patterson case. Uh, do you think of any other cases that are memorable to you? No, I can't. I can't think of any that uh, it stand out. Stand out. Um, the uh, uh, probably the, the 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 heaviest publicity received by the Supreme Court uh, came. Uh, it was sort of a negative thing, but it was during the period when they had the uh, uh, when they had the Supreme Court scandals and when they had the. Uh, uh, impeachment, I believe, of two or three of the justices. Uh, how did that surface, and how did it? Uh, how did this come about? <clears throat> well, 
I don't know just how it started, but uh, it it got very embarrassing to all of us, and we was all uh, undergoing a lot of pressure. Uh, the uh, bar. <coughs> Committee, the Board of Borough Governors appointed a committee uh, that we appeared before and asked numerous questions, and uh, we were examined by the legislature, all of us, and the FBI gave us all a good writing and uh, I have a clipping in my scrapbook if you care to see it but uh, who was found guilty and who were not. Was, uh, was it surprising to you all when this came up had there been uh, you know a lot of times you you can you you, you, you may not even necessarily suspect something is going on, and yet uh, sometimes symptoms are there that, uh, that, that, might, uh, uh, that, that might make it less surprising. Was it surprising to you when it first came up? Yes, I, <clears throat> very surprising. Mm -hmm. I never even thought about uh, such a thing. Had you ever been approached? Were you ever approached by somebody who was uh, uh, wanting to uh, influence a decision? I mean, no. I mean, obviously some were because uh, it yeah, came back, you know. And I didn't, uh, I didn't know whether all had been approached. I know when you, a person who makes the approach, it becomes very vulnerable when they do. Um, the uh, The uh, what uh, what caused this to begin to surface? Well, I can't uh, I can't answer that question because I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. I had uh, I, I had wondered whether it, uh, it came about as the kind of the investigation of someone who had lost a lawsuit and felt that maybe there was. A, I think uh, I think it might have started over the sale or something of uh, oh some corporation that uh, can't think the name of it now. Was it was it the asphalt thing? I forgot. No. Well, it was, that was another scandal. Yeah. Another state scandal. Oh, it's a big company. I can't think the name of it. The sale of a company or the sale of a product? Well, as I recall, it was a, some kind of an investment firm. Or Not, oh, select investment. Selected right. investment, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. That's right. It, uh, I remember that's correct. And Mr. Carroll was. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, what was the selected investments uh, case that hit the Supreme Court? I don't remember. Uh -huh. I, you are right. I remember when you mentioned that it was a selected investments mm -hmm. uh, case, but I didn't know uh, didn't know what what sort of case it was or what. Uh, uh, apparent, obviously, a case involving selected investments had to go before court at some time. As I remember, Hugh Carroll was supposed to have given uh, Judge Corn some money and he was supposed to divide it up with uh, with uh, Judge Welsh and Judge Welsh. Uh. Yes, Judge Welsh was uh, and uh, Judge Johnson, I believe. Yeah, and Judge Johnson. It would take to throw a case, let's see, how many on the Supreme Court? Nine. Nine, that's what I thought. It would take five to throw a case, but yeah. uh, uh, 
you might there might be some already favoring that way. It might take less than that to throw the balance. Mm-hmm. The uh, do you recall any experiences in the investigation that, uh, that that might be worth mentioning that historical importance? No, not uh, all of the investigations run into your financial condition and yeah. and. Uh, then too, they, the uh, bar particularly, uh, got to land down different cases and how certain people voted in this case and how the same people voted in another case and, and uh, so on. Establish a pattern. Yes. <clears throat> I remember now there was one lawyer on the course or on the panel, Earl Gray and Ordmore. Somebody asked a question about a particular case that they thought that the chain was running one way that uh, uh, in favor of the fellow who won it. And uh, so somebody asked me about that case. And Earl Gray spoke up and said, uh, well, "He he wrote a dissent in that case, so don't don't need to go any further in that mm-hmm. inquiry." The um, as I recall, they were placed. Replace was it three justices or four on uh, as a result of that, and I believe that this this led to the Supreme Court uh, to the reform of the selection of Supreme Court. And what did uh, uh, what was this change, and how did it come about? The the change in their Supreme Court selection. Well, it uh, came about through. A legislative act, of course, and uh, what it amounts to, the the only thing it amounts to, is you run for office just the same, but uh, you don't have any opponent running against you, and people vote to retain him or not. If somebody's kind of bad, they vote not to retain and I think it's a very good thing it, it gives the judges more time to they don't have campaign like they do going out and going through every blacksmith shop and everything like the usual candidate does now the original selection of a judge is based upon presently upon yeah, how the judge is originally selected. Uh, you have an opening. That's appointment by the governor. Is the yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then they get to run the next next election. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now uh, you had a number of new justices come in as a result of that. I believe that's when Judge Barry came in, wasn't it? After, or did he come? No, he was there before the scandal. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, he was. You, you had several new ones who were appointed. Uh, who were appointed after that? Well, let's see. I don't know whether anybody was appointed uh, in Judge Johnson's place or not, but I think the election was right. Shortly. After. Shortly thereafter, and Judge Lavender was elected. Yes. Uh-huh. And uh, let's 
Judge Welsh, Judge Hodges. Mm -hmm. Judge Hodges was appointed. He, was, he came yeah. in about that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of the, uh, who are some of the, um, to you, memorable judges among the younger judges, the new ones that came in? You have Judge Hodges or who came in new, John, Judge Barnes and others. Who are some of these who stand out in your, uh, uh, to you? Well, I would say they all stand out, and I, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't say that one of them Hard to. Mm -hmm. better than the other than the other. Sure. Mm -hmm. They're all good workers, mm -hmm. and uh, I think absolutely honest. You feel that the, uh, the, the reform has developed a better Supreme Court than I think so. It, uh, one thing, it gives you more time to take care of your work than uh, ordinarily. You don't have to go out campaigning. The time you'd spend campaigning, spe spend in your office. What? Uh portion of your time as a justice do you actually spend on the bench would you guess on the main bench on you the mean? bench yes well yes actually hearing cases oh I'd say an average of two hours a week most of our work's in, in, in your office and in the conference room. And what are you doing? Well, in the office, you're studying briefs and, and uh, writing opinions. Mm -hmm. And then when you write an opinion, uh, it's got to go through the conference. Mm -hmm. And the way they do that, for instance, the case is signed to me, I write the opinion in it, and then I circulate that opinion to all the judges. Each one of them get a copy of the opinion and a copy of the briefs, what the lawyers say. And uh, then I have the record, if any of them want to see the record, why well, they can see it. And then that, that's set on a regular docket. My case is set on a regular docket like everybody else's is. And uh, so we get uh, two weeks to look their cases over. And uh, make up her mind. And then, <clears throat> then the one who has the case in conference time, when it comes his time, he describes the case and tells all about it. Of course, we've had two weeks to read it, see? And, but he takes the lead in the discussion. And then when the discussion's over, why well, it goes around the table for each man to give his opinion on it and suggestions whether any changes ought to be made or whether he agrees with it or not, but first any changes and then the vote comes for the opinion, concur or dissent. If it has five concurrences, why, or four more with your vote be five, why it's adopted. And then anybody can write a dissent if they want to or write a specially concurring opinion and so forth. And then that, uh, Losing lawyers got uh, 15 days thereafter to file a petition for rehearing to set up why the opinion is wrong, and that's assigned to a third different judge entirely. Mm -hmm. And he keeps that rehearing, and he assigns the uh, briefs around just the same way, and that's set on a docket. and. Uh, then when it comes up, they vote on whether the petition should be granted or denied. If it's denied, why well, it's over. But uh, 
somebody might even then want to write something. And sometimes, not too often, but petitions for re-hearings are granted. Not very often. The, um, there are other experiences, I think, that uh, justices have participated in. I know that you have served, I believe, as a judge in the uh, some of the Freedom Foundation Awards, haven't you, in Valley Forge? Have you? Yes. Uh, want to tell about that experience, um, what, what that's like, and what your experience has been there? Well... <clears throat> I went to Valley Forge as a, one of the judges one time, and that was very interesting work. We judged uh, all, all different kind of things. The best cartoon in the country, and uh, the uh, all best essay in best editorial and things of that kind. And uh, then they grant an award. And then uh, I've said also uh, uh, when the awards are given, of course there's nothing to do, only they explain, do a little explaining and talking and give the awards up. It's a very nice thing. The, uh, would they have, uh, you, they have an awful lot of divisions in the Freedom Foundation, do you have, uh, uh, and I'm sure that all the judges wouldn't try to take all divisions, so they give you maybe uh, one or two different divisions oh, yes. to work with. Yes. And a lot of Supreme Court justices over the country are involved in judges in that full program. Yes. Supreme Court judges, and uh, <clears throat> well, they have, when I was up there, I remember they had uh, the national president of Kiwanis Club and, and, uh, and uh, some woman who was head of some woman's organization. I believe the Eastern Star. What are some other outstanding experiences you've had that uh, stand out in your memory? <laughs> well, I was uh, Made an honorary Cherokee Indian. Oh, you were? <laughs> yeah. Give you a headdress? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, is that, did they give you that one? Yeah. That's a beauty. I was admiring that a little earlier. That's when Judge Johnson was. Uh, Very active. In the, well, he was president of the All American Indian. His, yes, uh -huh. he was involved with the Indian Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. He was, uh, well, he, he, he was president of the yeah. All American Indian. Yes. Any other, uh, any other efforts or any other areas where you have been particularly active that might be worth mentioning? and singing. And Tell about that. Eh? Well, uh, I, I was president of the Glee Club at, when I was at the University of Oklahoma, and, and uh, I sang in the University Quartet, and uh, then I've sung in a lot of different quartets. I get a big kick out of it. And... Uh, was the one of the international directors of the SBEBSQUSA barbershop singing group. 
Doesn't that group have some roots in Oklahoma or not? Yes. That's yes. Right. Yes, it originated in Oklahoma. That's what I thought. Over in Tulsa. Yes, I thought it started in Tulsa. Were you one of the original? No. Who was the but organizer? What, what, who, was the, who, who was the key person in organizing? Oh, God. You know? Or does that precede your time? I knew him, but uh, uh, I can't think of the name now. That's That's been 50 years ago, yeah. you know. And I, I can't call her name uh, right now. But one of the great quartets was here from Oklahoma City, the Flatfoot Four. Yes, uh, you've had a number of good ones here. Yeah. Some today you still have good here. Not as good as the Flatfoot Four, uh, though. Anything else you think of? Are there, are there things in the Supreme Court we haven't talked about that we ought to? Not that I can think of. How about your family? Your own family? Well, <clears throat> I was married in 1917 to Barbara Wilhelm in Colgate, and we had one son, also named after me, Denver, and he was in the University of Oklahoma. At the time, he went to World War II, and he was a fighter pilot. He flew a P-40 plane, was catapulted off a boat, and made the original invasion into Africa, made 72 missions in Africa. and. They sent him back home for a while, and by this time he was a young captain. And uh, he stayed in Florida for several weeks, several months. He married. He married Susan Norris, a lady. And uh, they sent him back then to in the European theater. He was flying out of. England and France, and uh, they were doing uh, what they call dive bombing, uh, blowing up bridges to keep the Germans from repeating, uh, retreating. And uh, of course, when they were dive bombing, they were flying low, and the Germans were, had all their artillery stacked up on them. And he was shot down by a flag, and uh, he was reported missing for some months, but finally reported dead. And we brought his body back, and he's buried in Ada. And uh, my former wife died several years ago, and uh, I'm now married to.